Okay, so we're gonna talk about nuclear cardiology, some of the basics concepts. The first concept we're gonna talk about is actually radiation emissions. And you know, we have alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, we have beta particles, which are electrons, and we have gamma rays. And what we do in nuclear cardiology, whether it's single photon tomography or positron emission tomography, is look at gamma radiation because alpha radiation is, is basically stopped by a piece of tissue paper. Beta radiation is stopped by a sheet of just plain paper. And lead can only stop gamma rays. So we to see if we inject someone with a radiopharmaceutical, we have to be able to have it come out of the body. And the only way we can see that is with gamma radiation. So we talked a little bit about, uh, yesterday about the typical patient in the stress lab, and we talked about relative myocardial blood flow based on coronary flow reserve and how that was a very important concept. But there's another very important concept that we talk about in nuclear cardiology, and that has to do with what happens with radio tracer uptake dependent on flow. So if you can think of it conceptually, what you'd like to see, and actually you see this with O15 water, is that as myocardial blood flow increases, you get a linear increase in myocardial tracer uptake. But as you can see, most of the radio tracers we use, especially the uh, spec tracers like technesium, cestamibia, or tetrafosfin, have rollover at high flows. So in other words, as flow increases, uptake of tracer does not not. And this can lead to a, mis uh, uh, a relative redu reduction in terms of looking at differences in flow between normal areas where flow should be much higher as compared to abnormal areas. So just to show you how that might work, for instance, uh, take O15 water, which is taken up linearly according to blood flow, and then let's look at one of these newer agents, which is called fluorpyridase, which is also pretty linear, versus rubidium which as you can see has a lot of uh, uh, rollover at high flow rates. So if you're looking for a 25% reduction in, in flow in normal areas compared to abnormal areas, you would see that you could see this very nice with O15 water or flow of 2.4 in normal regions versus 1.8 in abnormal regions. But let's look at a, a drug like fluorpyridase, which only has a 94% extraction fraction. Now it would be 2.4 in the normal region versus 1.8 in the abnormal region. So you'd only, instead of seeing a 25% reduction in counts, it'd only be 20%. And then looks, let's look at rubidium, which has even a worse extraction fraction. So at a 2.4 uh, milliliter per minute per gram of blood flow, you would only be able to see actually a 10% difference in counts. So this rollover causes a lot of, of homogeneity within images where you're trying to look at heterogeneity in flow between abnormal and normal regions. So coronary flow reserve is very important. We want to increase flow, but we want our tracers also to be accurate in measuring those differences in flow in order to image someone. Fluorpyridase is one such agent which is actually going to be coming into the clinical arena probably in the next year or two, and it is a PET agent. It's got very low energy. It's got better spatial resolution, and its extraction fraction, as I said, is already is linear to blood flow, which should improve diagnostic capabilities. Plus, it has a very low radiation exposure. And um, just to show you an example, this is a uh, patient uh, who had a Sestamibi study where you may see a little inferior defect. And again, remember, this is because of extraction fraction issues. And with fluorpyridase, you see marked abnormalities in flow at stress compared to basically improvement at rest. So we think this agent is going to be very, very good in terms of really looking at flow in a more categorical fashion and being able to more accurately diagnose what we do. Now, once we uh, stress the patient and once we inject the radiopharmaceutical, then we have to image that patient. So what happens is, I said, because of gamma rays, that they're able to get out of, the, out, of the, out of the body. They hit a lead collimator, so as you only get uh, uh, photons, these emissions that are parallel to the patient or the organ being imaged getting into to the sodium iodide crystal. And then when the, when the photon hits the crystal, it causes an emission a scintillation, a little bit of light. And that little bit of light is then amplified by these things called photomultiplier tubes. And we're able to tell where that's coming from by looking at the X, Y, and Z uh, locations of that and to create an image. And most of that, again, uh, in conventional gamma cameras is used looking, uh, using a, a sodium iodide crystal. We now have new systems which use cesium uh, CZT detectors, which are much more sensitive, much more efficient, 
and, uh, and allow us to use much less radiation. And these uh, new systems have been out for about the last five to 10 years. And in fact, what that's nice about them is that they directly produce electrical current and they don't use photomultiplier tubes anymore. So that, that also improves the uh, spatial resolution of the technique. This is just an example of how we can use these new techniques. This is looking at a full-time image, but using half the radiation dose that we would typically use in a, in a conventional gamma camera, and yet you can see very nice imaging. And this is using half-time imaging with a full dose, and you get basically identical pictures. So it gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how we can image patients, depending on whether we want to image the patient longer and therefore use half, uh, half the dose, or image the patient shorter, maybe the patient's not cooperative, and then give a full dose instead. The other issue is that you know uh, nuclear cardiology has been uh, talked about a lot because of the issue of radiation exposure. When you use thallium, you get high radiations, like 25 millisieverts. Standard uh, stress rest imaging is about 12 to 14 millisieverts. But by using these new kinds of crystals and new kinds of imaging systems, we can get down to about five to six millisieverts. And if we do stress-only imaging, in other words, do the stress study first, and if the perfusion is normal, not do the rest study, we can get down to one to two millisieverts. And that competes very nicely with CT systems, which I'll talk about uh, uh, in the next lecture, which actually can give down to one millisievert of radiation, depending on the systems that are used. So with that kind of background, let's talk a little bit about the applications of stress uh, myocardial perfusion imaging. One, obviously, is the detection of coronary artery disease, both the extent and location. The detection of ischemia, because we know that ischemia is not a good thing to have, and we can look at both silent and symptomatic ischemia. By knowing ischemia and other parameters, we can risk stratify patients ac across all clinical risk categories. And this includes patients with acute chest pain. And, and in our institution, we commonly image patients with myocardial perfusion imaging who are low to intermediate risk that come in through the chest pain unit because of uh, uh, new onset symptoms. And we can also assess therapeutics and track risk. So let's look at some of the data in terms of detection of disease. This is a meta-analysis of spec results. You can see, irrespective of the stressor you use, whether it's exercise or vasodilator stress or dobutamine, the sensitivity is relatively good. It's around 90%, with specificity around 75%, but with the use of attenuation uh, a, a correction, which, it which accounts for uh, artifacts uh, that we pick up, and also gating of the images, we can get over 90% specificity. So we have about 80 about 90% sensitivity and about 90% specificity for detecting disease. Now, in terms of uh, how SPECT compares to PET, you can see in pool data, they're actually pretty comparable. You have uh, about 88% for, for SPECT and 90% for PET. And in terms of uh, uh, sensitivity and specificity, about the same. So here's pooled specificity. Uh, and again, you can see very comparable numbers between SPECT and PET. Now, although we like to diagnose coronary disease, actually the more important issue that we deal with in, in, uh, in clinical practice is identifying risk. So this is a typical myocardial perfusion scan. You can see this patient has a biggest, this is a stress image and a rest image, a large ischemic defect in the septum, which improves, in the apex, which improves, et cetera. We can look at wall motion and look at the functional aspects of this. We can look at the size of the perfusion defect by quantifying it using polar map uh, reconstructions. And so not only do we accurately diagnose uh, myocardial disease and ischemia, but we, un we can then understand the prognostic implications. What has been shown in many, many studies is if you have a normal myocardial perfusion scan, and these are in patients with suspected or known disease, you have about a half percent death or myocardial infarction rate on an annual basis versus a 6% uh, death NMI rate if you have an abnormal study, so about a tenfold difference. And so in many respects, a normal myocardial perfusion scan is a gatekeeper to invasive cardiac procedures such as coronary angiography. So by using nuclear imaging up front, you can avoid cath in a lot of patients. The other, on the flip side, an abnormal uh, ab, uh, perfusion scan clearly predicts outcome. And it appears as though the larger the perfusion defect, it's not just a yes or no answer, the size of the perfusion defect and the extent of ischemia matters. And so if you look at these data, 
as the size of the perfusion defect increases, both total events and cardiac death NMI increase exponentially. And there seems to be an inflection point somewhere around 10 to 15% of the myocardium where you see this ramping up of, uh, of events, both total and death NMI events, uh, when you have an ischemic defect size over about 10 to 15%. This has also been shown in, spec in PET imaging. This is a registry of 7,000 patients with known or suspected CAD. You can see with a normal study of a very low event rate, and once you get above about a 20% perfusion defect, you can see the increase in event rates. And when you look at all-cause mortality, this is also shown the same way. When you look at ischemia, there's a 34% increase in cardiac death for every 10% increase in ischemic myocardium. So ischemia does matter and is a driving uh, uh, force in terms of how we evaluate patients. Uh, the ejection fraction is also an important uh, determinant of, uh, of outcome, and it fits in very nicely with the perfusion results. So these are looking at normal perfusion results mild to moderate abnormalities or severe abnormalities, and then based on patients with greater than 45% EF versus less than 45% EF. In a normal patient, it doesn't seem to matter very much in terms of the outcome. But when you look at patients who are intermediate, and again, uh, where's my little, it's not advancing. If you, look at, if you look at intermediate risk patients, you can see that the ejection fraction clearly picks up a low and high risk group, and in those with severe abnormalities as well. So ejection fraction helps uh, uh, very, very much in this regard. I think I have to do this. Next, okay. This is also shown when you look at patients who are coming in with low to intermediate risk who come in with acute chest pain. There's a lot of data on CT in that population, and there's also a lot of data in nuclear cardiology in that population. And you can see that we get about comparable results, about a, a negative predictive value of about 99 to 100% with CT, but we also see a very high negative predictive value with SPECT, and along with a very high sensitivity of around 87%. So nuclear and CT are commonly used in evaluating patients in the acute chest pain setting, and nuclear fares very well, and we use that very commonly uh, in our institution. This is a study we actually published uh, in 2012 looking at, uh, uh, at 1,576 patients who prospectively went through our chest pain unit and had uh, a denison imaging uh, in most of these patients. And if you look at patients with a normal myocardial perfusion scan, and this is over uh, several years of follow-up, you can see basically no events, and all of the events were in patients who had abnormal studies. So a normal study really does predict a low-risk individual. The other uh, thing I want to bring up is that in the normal group, only 3% underwent invasive coronary angiography, and less than 1% got revascularized. So again, a normal study is a very good way to use nuclear as a gatekeeper to the cath lab. However, this, in patients who had abnormal studies, 54% went for invasive coronary angiography and 38% got revascularized. So nuclear is a way of streamlining who needs to go to the cath lab and who doesn't. So when we think about the rationale for uh, assessing uh, ischemia, we try to identify patients unlikely to benefit from an interventional approach. Those would be low-risk patients with a normal study or with small perfusion defects. Those would also be higher-risk patients with perfusion defects, but who do not have myocardial ischemia, where interventions would not improve the outcome in that patient. And also to identify high-risk patients where intensive uh, medical therapy or interventional procedures would be warranted. The other important concept that when you look at increasing risk, risk increases with the extent of jeopardized ischemic myocardium, with the extent of coronary artery disease, with the worsening of clinical scenarios, and as the ejection fraction drops. So if you remember all of those basic concepts, that, sh that will give you a very good clinical idea of, uh, of risk. Now, the last, in the last few slides, I just want to talk a little bit about this whole idea of where coronary revascularization works and its superiority to medical therapy and where nuclear imaging is actually going to be helpful in this area in terms of deciding therapy. 
You know, there have been several trials, and Dr. Ramshandani talked about this yesterday in terms of looking at patients' uh, uh, medical therapy versus revascularization. These are our data from the INSPIRE study where we randomized people to medical therapy versus revascularization and, and saw no difference in events. This is the COURAGE data, which he talked about uh, yesterday also, and the BARRY2 data, which was in stable diabetes, showing no difference. As I said yesterday, there's been a lot of data showing that either with PET imaging, and this is using all the different studies, or with SPECT imaging, we can show marked reductions in perfusion defect sizes with the use of serial myocardial perfusion images. This is just one example of a patient of mine several years ago who had a big septal abnormality, a large perfusion defect of 26%. This patient actually went for cath, and he had this huge first septal perforator, which was severely diseased. We didn't do anything about this, but treat this patient with nitrates, beta blockers, and calcium channel blockers. And he came back several weeks later and had another study, and it's completely normal. So we can look at those kind of abnormalities and differences. There's now some data from the COURAGE study, the sub-study in nuclear, because you remember the overall COURAGE study, which Dr. Ramshandani talked about yesterday, this looks at serial imaging comparing PCI plus optimal medical therapy versus optimal me medical therapy alone. And although PCI did do a better job in terms of mean reductions, there were still marked reductions in perfusion defect size from the pre to the post treatment using medical therapy alone. And in fact, in this study, what they showed is that there was the amount of residual ischemia after therapy did predict outcome. So if you had no residual ischemia, you did extremely well. Whereas if you had still more than 10% ischemia, you did poorly. And in fact, there is some uh, retrospective data from Dr. Berman's lab also looking at this, saying that the inflection point in terms of when you need to put someone on to having revascularization versus medical therapy is somewhere around 10 to 12% of the myocardium. Dr. Ramshandani talked about this yesterday, but believe me, this is not a known, uh, necessarily a, a dogma. This is something that's still in, in being evaluated. And in fact, on my last slide, there is a trial going on right now called the Ischemia Study, which is taking 8,000 patients who have moderate to severe ischemia by nuclear criteria or ECHO or CMR and more than 10% ischemic myocardium who have a blinded CT to rule out no disease or left main disease and then are being randomized to either invasive strategy with optimal medical therapy plus optimal revascularization versus optimal medical therapy alone. This is still recruiting patients. In the next five to seven years, we should have results. And maybe we'll finally get at this idea of when, what is the best way to identify risk and, and treat patients based on non-invasive imaging. Thanks very much.